بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد أبرد السيسترز everyone and everything every human being every movement every country every race every people every nation uh, has a signature it has an identifying factor an identifying feature the signature of islam is mercy allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced himself as ar rahman ar rahim the most beneficent the most merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced him, his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as We have not sent you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as anything other than a mercy to all of creation Alameen to the worlds whatever that means in terms of Allah's creation he knows it best It is the nature of Islam to be merciful The reason I'm saying this is because in the context of living Islam, people are not impressed by what we say. People are impressed by what we do because what we say, they cannot experience it. They can only hear it. But what we do is what they feel. What we do is how they feel. And that's why there's a quote that we use in customer service. We say that people will not remember what you did, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And that's the reason why it's very important for us to look at our own con- our own conduct and how we approach people how we talk to people how we interact with people uh, and always be trying to be conscious of the effect that we have on people please understand that for people their perception is reality you might say well you know i never said that i never meant that true enough fair enough uh, you may not, you may not have meant it uh, you may not even have said it but the what you did say or the way you said it even if it is unintentional it can have consequences both positive and negative if the consequences are positive alhamdulillah uh, that's also not something to feel very happy about because you don't know why it was positive right it's unconsciously positive something happened but anyway since the result is good uh, we say okay it's good but if it's if it is negative if the consequences were negative um, then there is a price to pay and that price to pay is that you have given a negative impression about islam Uh, brothers and sisters please understand this very clearly i remind myself and you that we all complain today that we say that oh, but why do people blame islam for everything you know it is the individual muslim who is doing something which is wrong why do you say it is islam you know just think about that nothing changed throughout history this is how it has always been muslims have always been equated with islam the only difference was that the salafus salihin the original the early muslims who were the companions of rasulullah sallallahu and those who came after them in excellence these people were happy to be identified as representatives of islam they the sahaba used to say kunu mislana they used to say become like us be like us why didn't they say that they didn't say be like muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they said be like us because that doesn't mean you are, you are not like muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you are not showing there because you're saying that i am with you you can see me so be like me and alhamdulillah inshallah i am like muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam So when I'm saying be like me, uh, I'm in effect saying be like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because I'm like him. This is what this was the the logic behind the Sahaba saying Kunu uh, Mislana, be like us. My brother and sister, the same thing has happened. People used to equate Muslims with Islam. People still equate Muslims with Islam. The problem is what the result is. When people equated Muslims with Islam, and those Muslims were the people who were the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the result was positive. when people in uh, equate muslim with islam and when those muslims are people like us then the, then the result is not negative is is not positive so we need to look at ourselves we need to uh, ask ourselves what is it that i am doing uh, where i am afraid that if people equate me with islam then the result will be negative why am i why am i putting myself in that situation why am i behaving like this the whole point of living islam is to consciously be aware of the impression the image that we are creating in society i am not saying you work for that you are you working to please allah subhanahu wa taala but when you are working to please allah subhanahu wa taala what is the metrics the metrics is the feedback of the people what are what are the people saying verbally or by their behavior by their demeanor by their uh, their interaction with you uh, and what is that feedback what is it telling you in terms of how you are coming across to them 
if I want to give a positive impression about Islam, then I need to come across positively to the people I come into contact with. And if that is not happening, there's no point in blaming the people. There's no point in saying something is wrong with you. Nothing is wrong with them. They are only responding to what they are seeing. So I need to look at myself and say, what is it that I'm showing? Please understand, demonstration means to actually act. You can't demonstrate by talking. You can demonstrate talking by talking, but you can't demonstrate anything else by talking. You demonstrate by showing the power of the seeing. Nabi Sallallahu himself said this. He said that, لَيْسَ الْخَبَرُ كَالْمُعَيْنَ وَكَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَاةُ وَسَلَامُ He said the khabar, the information, the news is not the same as seeing it. The seeing it is seeing is believing. Look at all the uh, TV shows that we see. For example, take the, cook, the cook, cooking classes, the cooking shows that we see that we see on television. What are the people doing? They are actually cooking. They will cook something and show you. Even though we know that that is being done for show, maybe some of, the, some of, the, some of that food photography is done using other materials, not the actual uh, stuff that we eat uh, because the other material looks, uh, uh, looks nicer. And straight. For example, if, you, if it's an ice cream, uh, then uh, it, it won't melt. If it is not an actual ice cream, it's made of you know, some foam or something. Uh, leave, leave that aside. The point is that the visible impact of that cooking glass is amazing. You start salivating. Uh, maybe you don't drool, but you start salivating and you start, you, you, you love, you, you want to learn how to cook that thing because it looks so delicious. Now, this is the whole issue. How does Islam look to the people who are looking at us? Does it look delicious? Does it look like something that, oh, wow, this is fantastic. You know, I really want to learn learn about this thing. Uh, I really want to be like this person. I, I really want to um, find out from this person what is it that you are doing? Uh, what kind of a life do you have? Because uh, you seem to be so much in harmony with everything and you are not stressed out and you are not freaking out about this and that and the other. Uh, you are kind and you are considerate. Uh, what is it that you uh, do? You know, what's your philosophy? What's your behavior like? Uh, what do you eat? What do you wear? How do you sleep? And so on and so forth. Um, who do you worship? What's your what's your religion? We want people to actually ask these questions because they're so impressed, because they're so so impressed and so uh, moved by their interaction with us. Now, in this context, as I said, the signature of this religion is mercy. It is Rahman. What is mercy? Mercy is the is the foundation of forgiveness. Mercy is the reason we forgive. Uh, mercy means that we respond to evil with good, not evil with evil, uh, even though that would be justice. To punish evil is justice and Islam doesn't, doesn't shy away from Islam actually promotes justice. But Islam also promotes something more than that. Uh, in, in Allah, Ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to be, to be just and then to do more. What is that more? That more is mercy. This mercy is to forgive even though the person deserves to be punished. Now, the question of the person having done wrong, is it's not even a question. Of course, they did wrong. That's the reason why they deserve to be punished. Because many times people will come and tell you, when you say forgive somebody, you say, no, but you know, he did this. Of course he did it. He, nobody is doubting that. Nobody is denying that. He did it. That is the reason why we are saying forgive the man. If he had not done it, then where is the question of forgiving? He did it. But even though he did it, if you forgive him, Rasulullah guaranteed you something. Rasulullah guaranteed you and me a great reward if we forgive, even though uh, even though the person deserved to be uh, to be punished. For example, in the in the famous hadith, uh, Rasulullah he said, "I guarantee a house in Jannah for the one who gives up arguing, even if he is in the right." Now, here is a person who's uh, who's who's uh, who's your your counterpart, and this person is arguing on something which is wrong. You forgive that, you give up the argument. The Mishra says, "I guarantee a house in Jannah for the one who gives up arguing, even if he is in the right, and I guarantee a house in the middle of Jannah for the one who abandons lying, even for the sake of fun, who doesn't even tell a lie as a joke." And then he said, I guarantee a house in the highest part of the Jannah for the one who has good manners. And this is in Abu Dawud. Remember what I said about how you make them feel. How do you make them feel means good manners. How does a person feel valued? Because you treat them 
with respect and with dignity. How does a person feel uh, and remember you? I was traveling, it was Ramadan many years ago. It was Ramadan, I was uh, on a flight uh, in India. I was in a, on a flight, I think, to, from Hyderabad to Bangalore or, or Hyderabad to Delhi or something. I can't re recall now. Uh, there was a person sitting next to me. The stewardess brought the meal. So I said, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, thank you very much. I, I won't eat. Uh, I'm fasting. The person next to me uh, said, turned to me, he said, uh, do you mind if I eat? If it's any problem, then I also won't eat. So I said, no, of course, please, please go ahead and eat. And then I asked his name later and his name was George. Now, he was a person who was not a Muslim, uh, but he was considerate enough to ask me whether he could eat while I was sitting in the next seat. I mean, this is his right to have his meal. And I have no, absolutely no zero objection if he had his meal. But here is the man with this manner. Now, think about that. That, uh, that this incident, small incident, happened many years ago it's fresh in my mind and i'm telling you i'm telling you about this incident i'm telling you the man's name now think about this this is how uh, the impression the image of islam gets built which is by our manners my brothers and sisters uh, abdullah ibn amr uh, anhu, he reported from rasul uh, who said the merciful will be shown mercy by the most merciful the merciful will be shown mercy by the most arhamur rahimin, by the most merciful. Be merciful to those on earth and the one in the heavens will have mercy on you and this is in Tirmidhi. Nabi is saying two things here. He's saying those who show mercy will be shown mercy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Show mercy to the people on the earth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show mercy to you. My brothers and sisters, uh, we are, if you, if you look at this, uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi also said, uh, He who does not show mercy to our little ones and who does not recognize the rights of our elders is not one of us. And this is in uh, Musnad Imam Muhammad. Uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, Be merciful to others and you will receive mercy. Forgive others and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will forgive you. And this is also in Musnad Imam Muhammad. There are many ahadiths which uh, tell us to be merciful, which tell us to forgive each other, which tell us to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the famous hadith where he said that the, this ummah is like one body. If the head pains, the whole body feels this pain. Right? You get a fever or you get the whole body feels uneasy and painful because one part of the body is, 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 uh, is paining. Today we are like a body which the head has been separated from the rest of the body. The, the pain area seems to have gone off somewhere else. The rest of the body doesn't look like it's feeling anybody's pain. May Allah forgive us. Uh, this is not the nature, this is not the signature, this is not the, the visage of Islam. My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he said in this uh, beautiful ayat of uh, Surah Al-Zumar, where Allah said, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَقْفِرُ ذُنُوبَ جَمِيعَ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُرُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, say, ya ibadi, say, oh my slaves. Now imagine, this is the this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jalla Jalaluhu. He is talking about people who have committed sins. Because Allah is saying, Qul ya ibadi, which one, who, wa, which slaves? Alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim. Say to them, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa O my slaves, those who have transgressed against themselves. Now Allah is calling those people who have disobeyed him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling those people who have, uh, who have angered him. His slaves, my slaves. Imagine, you know, in, in our life, uh, we like to call those people we like and we uh, appreciate. We, of course, we will, we, we will uh, own them and we uh, like to call them, uh, you know, our people, my friends, uh, my... Uh, many times you see this in families. If the child does something, uh, something right, then the father will say to the mother, see what my son did. And if he does something wrong, the, the father will say to the mother, see what your son did. You know, we, we tend to distance those who disobey or those who do something wrong. We tend to distance, distance them uh, from ourselves. We don't like to own them. But this is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is owning those who transgressed. Allah is owning those who went against him. Allah is owning those who uh, disobeyed him. And Allah is saying, Qul ya ibadi. Say, O oh my slaves, Alladina Asrafu Ala Anfusim, those who transgressed against themselves, 
because the sinning is not doesn't harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I commit a sin, the sin harms me. If I drink alcohol, it's my body which is getting abused. If I'm taking drugs, I'm smoking, uh, I'm, I'm using tobacco or whatever, or any, any other drug, I'm harming my own body. Uh, if I'm doing, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing anything which is wrong, which Allah has prohibited, I'm harming myself. If I'm gambling, I'm losing my money, I'm destroying myself. So the, 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 here the issue of understanding sin is that we don't harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are not doing a favor to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by living a clean life. A clean life is beneficial for me and a clean life also uh, enables me to create a positive impression about uh, uh, to others who see me, who are my neighbors and my colleagues and my friends and so on and so forth. They see me and if, I, if my life is clean, uh, inshallah, they will, be, they will be influenced by that. So Allah is saying, those who transgress against themselves, but they are my slaves. And then what is he saying? La tapna tum mir rahmatillah. Do not despair of the rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't think that Allah will not forgive you. Do not think that I have done so much evil that Allah will never forgive me. No, this is from shaitan. Shaitan uh, is one of the deceptions of shaitan. That shaitan will tell you that, oh, you know what? You can't be forgiven because... Uh, you have committed so many sins so you may as well continue to commit those sins the whole point of uh, shaitan wanting you to despair from the rahmat of Allah from the mercy of Allah is because he wants you to continue to commit sins he doesn't want you to repent because he says what's the point of repenting because Allah is not going to forgive Allah is denying that Allah is saying very clearly قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Inna Allah yaqfiru zunuba jamia. Inna hu wal ghafur rahim. Verily and truly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all sins. And verily and truly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the most forgiving and the most merciful. Hu wal ghafur rahim. My brothers and sisters, see this beautiful ayat of Surah Al-Zuma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He emphasized and reiterated his mercy and forgiveness, how many times? Allah, first and foremost, Allah is saying, Ya Ibadi, Allah is calling us his slaves. That itself is an expression of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, La taqnatu min rahmatillah. The second uh, expression of the mercy of Allah, Allah is saying that do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Then Allah is saying, Inna Allah yaqfiru zunuba jaliya. Verily and truly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all sins. Yet another reinforcement of the mercy of Allah. Innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim Yet again, a reinforcement of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one ayat, Allah has reinforced His mercy and His forgiveness. How many times? So therefore, what is it that we must do? As I mentioned to you, the hadith of from Rabbi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this. He said, the, the, uh, if you show mercy, Allah will show mercy on you. So when we forgive people, we must keep this in mind that you are not forgiving the, the person because of that person. You are forgiving the person because you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. I need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. Wallahi. Is there anybody who can say that I do not need the forgiveness of Allah so I will not forgive this person? No, there is nobody. Every single person needs the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone needs the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said to us, Sayyidah Aisha, he said, nobody will enter Jannah on the basis of his deeds. Sayyidah Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, even you, he said, even me. He said, then how will we get Jannah? He said, by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give Jannah. And this is what Allah will give. Then he said, why must we do deeds? Because once Allah gives Jannah, then in the Jannah, the darajat, the rewards in the Jannah that Allah will give, will be in keeping with the deeds that the person did. So the, all the good deeds, therefore we need to continue to do good deeds for two reasons. Firstly, because good deeds attract the mercy of Allah. So therefore we need the mercy of Allah. And secondly is inshallah, in, uh, once we uh, Allah forgives us inshallah and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness, then Allah will give us Jannah based on our good deeds. I mean Allah will give us the darajat in Jannah based on our good. Jannah will, co will come because of the mercy of Allah. And the darajat in Jannah will come because of the good deeds we do. Now think about this. When we are uh, in our daily interaction and so on and so forth, what happens? People make mistakes. When people make a mistake, our instant reaction is to criticize them. Inter instant reaction is to, uh, within quotes, correct them. Now, before we go into the correction aspect of it, we need to look at our own intention. What is the intention of correcting this person? Is it... Really, are you interested in the benefit of that person or are you correcting that person to show how much you know 
uh, are you correcting this person to show off that okay you are ignorant i have more knowledge which one is it what what is it because that's the first uh, test that we must uh, take for ourselves and satisfy ourselves that my correction is for the benefit of the individual it is not in order to insult the individual it i'm not trying to get back at the individual and my correction is not another way of showing my anger or my displeasure with the individual uh, i'm not doing it for any of those reasons i'm doing it because i'm genuinely interested in that person many times i have seen that people uh, do corrections in a way which is demeaning which is hurting and this doesn't help because the the whole issue of uh, giving and receiving of critical feedback is if the feedback is given in a way which is a derogatory which is uh, insulting uh, and which attacks the dignity of the individual then the individual quite naturally gets so involved with feeling bad about it that he or she will never pay attention to the thing that you actually told them so here even if you had a good intention to say that i need to correct the behavior of this person and the way you correct it the behavior does not get corrected on the contrary the person just ends up feeling bad and that negative feeling is of no use to anybody so therefore we need to ask ourselves uh, what we must do i remember the beautiful uh, beautiful incident once uh, where in uh, in cape town uh, the person recited quran and uh, when he was reciting uh, quran I, i i could make out that he was egyptian because uh, for for the for the ja he uh, would say ga right so janna is ganna uh, jamal is gamal and jamil is gamil uh, so this person recited quran then after uh, it finished then we were sitting there the uh, imam of the masjid he gave him this beautiful dua and he said may allah subhanahu wa taala bless you for your recitation and on the day of judgment may allah subhanahu wa taala uh call out and announce and ask you to come and may allah ask you to recite quran before him as beautifully as you recited today in this masjid now imagine here is this person who is praising the recitation of this of, of this other individual and he is giving him this beautiful dua so alhamdulillah now the thought in my mind was but you know however he made this mistake in the makhadij of uh, of saying this of jannah gana now later on i i had a uh, the opportunity of uh, asking this uh, imam uh, i said for my own understanding and my own correction uh, you know what did you think he said you know i you uh, said your your point is valid in the sense that uh, yes uh, janna is janna it's not ganna but he said you know uh, on the day of judgment allah is not going to look at the pronunciation of that person allah is going to look at his heart and if this person was reciting the quran with khushu and with sincerity and with the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his kalam in his heart then inshallah allah will forgive him if he made a mistake if he made a mistake in the makharij or in the way of uh, you know pronouncing a particular word he said in any case there are different people of different uh, areas different regions people who speak different languages who by nature say or or, or uh, pronounce certain words differently from others now i know i come from from india and we people urdu speaking people for example i'll give you two or two or three examples urdu people urdu speaking people we have a way of pronouncing qaf and kha in the same way and that is kha so in, if you if you ask an urdu speaking person to recite and if he is saying qala uh, he will say khala now we know in arabic khala means mother sister right and qala is he said So when you when if an Urdu speaking person is reciting Quran, if we say Khala, he's not talking about his aunt. He means he means Khala, uh, except that he because of his Urdu language, uh, you know, on his uh, influence of the Urdu language, uh, he says Khala. He is not deliberately saying that because he wants to miss recite the Quran. There is no evil intention behind that. This is his tongue. This is his language. This is the influence of his language. just like if an egyptian is reciting instead of janna he will say ganna he is not saying that deliberately to distort the the word of the quran that is his language the way he speaks the egyptian dialect he decide, he says it like that uh, for for example uh, people with uh, who speak punjabi right we have in, in pakistan for example people who speak punjabi muslim people who speak punjabi uh, for them uh, the qaf is uh, for the urdu speaking people it is kha for for the punjabi speaking people it is ka 
So instead of saying kalb, they will say kalb. So if a person says, I am purifying my kalb, he is not talking about washing his dog. He is talking about purifying his heart. Right? So kalb. He, he means kalb. He doesn't mean, when I, if he says, I, I must purify my uh, my my kalb, he is not talking, he is not saying, I am going to wash my dog. Right? So the, the, the simple, just as the Uzu speaking person, uh, if he says khala, he is not talking about his aunt. He's talking about, he's saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this or people said this as the as the ayat of the Quran might be. So it's very important for us to think about this and not get caught up in one small thing. Uh, I'm not saying small in the sense of I'm not uh, trying to, uh, you know, demean or, uh, or discount the importance of the Quran. Many times these are all uh, things that people uh, misread and uh, also we tend to... Um, misinterpret uh, words out of context of culture. Yeah, for example, if somebody uses the word small, uh, in, a, in the English language, small is a value neutral word. Small doesn't necessarily mean anything bad. But in Urdu, for example, uh, chota has a different meaning. Chota sometimes means, it means small as in affectionate, it means small as in quantity, it, got, it can also mean small as in less important, right? less important. Halka, for example, light. Uh, if you say something is light in in English, it has there, there's no there's no value connotation on that. But uh, in Urdu, if you say halka, it means something which is valueless. It means light also, but it means something which is valueless. So if you if you are if you are talking to people in a particular language, one must keep in mind that the language and the words used must be interpreted in the context of the culture of that language, uh, not in the culture of some other language. Because that that way, you know, you you, you don't uh, you you get the wrong impression about the word. So it's very important to understand this and say that when I am criticizing somebody. So now, for example, you might say, well, you know, then in, is tajweed unimportant? Uh, should we not correct somebody if his tajweed is wrong? Of course, the tajweed is extremely important. Of course, you must correct somebody if the tajweed is wrong. But do correct with love and with kindness and with uh, with understanding that this person. Uh, is reciting Quran because he loves Allah, because he loves the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the middle of that, you 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 point a finger and you say, oh, you know what, this uh, ayin, you did not uh, bring it out properly, and this kaf, you did not do that. In in this case, there was a ba, uh, and there was a da, and you did not mention the khalkhala. Uh, it completely destroys the inner feeling of the heart of that person. Right? So he's gone now, he's disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, which he was connected with, with the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which he was connected with, he got disconnected because of your intervention. Allah wa ta'ala. Well, really ask yourself, is this what you wanted to do? Did you want to disconnect the abd from his rab? Because if that's what you wanted to do, then good news to you, you were successful. But if that's not what you wanted to do, then make tawbah, make istighfar and say, Allah, I, am, I, I apologize to you uh, and I seek your pardon that I did this, I did it with a good intention. I want the man to recite uh, the kala your kalam correctly, but maybe this time and place was wrong. So therefore, think of another time and place where you can do that. This is the expression of mercy. The point I'm saying is that mercy means to forgive somebody who is wrong. Now, take, take this in another context. Take, take it in the case of, for example, in our family relations, right? We, you know, we have uh, people in our homes, in most of our homes, it is the lady of the house, she cooks the food, so she gets the food, the food comes on the table and uh, you eat the food, alhamdulillah. Uh, you know, is the food always perfect? Well, it depends on who's cooking. Sometimes some people are absolute masters at it, so it's always perfect. But in most cases, it's not always perfect. So there is sometimes, there is something, you know, wrong with the food. There's too much of salt or too little salt or something and so on and so forth. But think now at that point in time, are you going to criticize the person? Are you going to forget? Take, take the, the important thing is to take into account the whole picture. Now, what's the whole picture? The whole picture is here is this person who went out of their way. Uh, they must have got up earlier than you did. Uh, they stood there at the stove and they worked on it. And with the best of intentions, they did their best and they produced something for you. At the end of all of that, the taste is not to your liking. Now, what do you want to do? You want to trash this whole effort because the taste was not to your liking. Or do you want to take into account this whole effort and say, who cares about the taste? Alhamdulillah, it is food, it is nutritious, it is halal, it is going to, it, to help my body. Taste is only in the tongue. Once it, once it goes behind the tongue, taste makes no difference. 
uh, once it goes down the gullet takes was taste makes no difference alhamdulillah rabbil alamin allah gave me taste buds let me thank allah that i can taste that i am capable of tasting there's a friend of mine whose uh, wife uh, he has four children she says after the third child suddenly her taste buds completely stopped functioning there's nothing wrong with her she is 100% perfect except that her taste buds do not function what does that mean it means that she cannot taste anything so whether it is sweet whether it is sour whether it's chili whether it is uh, salty not salty uh, whatever it is she says everything tastes like cardboard like like you know like uh, tissue paper or something uh, she so food has no meaning for her she she has food has absolutely zero meaning for her now think about that you are making a noise because allah gave you taste buds if allah had taken away your taste buds then no 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 issue right your your wife or whoever is cooking uh, or your husband is cooking yeah, he could have been cooking she could have been cooking any trash you would have eaten it because uh, it it makes no difference to you so is thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say alhamdulillah ya allah you gave me taste buds that is the reason why i can taste that this food has got too much of salt or too little salt but i know and i recognize that this razik is not my wife the razik is not my husband the razik is not the cook it's not the chef it's not the waiter the razik is al razaq zul khuwati al matin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalu yalla you gave me this food this food came to you came to me from you and i should complain i should complain about this in the life of allah allah how do i complain about this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the food allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gave me taste buds and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that sometimes the salt is more or the salt is less so that i can appreciate the fact that all the rest of the time it is perfect so that i can appreciate the fact that i have taste buds that i can that i am able to distinguish between grass and between good food right i am i'm not just eating something imagine it's it's very natural uh, you know in many cases we compare ourselves to to animals and we we give animals uh within i i don't even like to say human qualities because human beings are not like that but i'm saying noble qualities we say when a brave like a lion or or uh, stealthy like a leopard or or something imagine if you were a lion you would be eating rotten meat you would be eating offal you would be eating intestines full of dung right that is what you would be eating if you were a lion thank god that are yet you're not a lion thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are a human being that you eat food which is beautiful which is aromatic which is uh, which is pure uh, which is also nutritious i mean so is raw meat the lions uh, are are getting the nutrition from raw meat they they getting nutrition from eating offal they are getting nutrition from eating uh, semi processed dung from the intestines of cattle uh, and and antelopes and deer and so on which they kill uh, because that gives them new micronutrients and so on and so forth but they're getting it in that form they're not getting it the way you get it and i get it because we get it because alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as human beings and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that we get this so think about that that now talking about forgiveness here is somebody who did a whole lot of effort and at the end of that maybe something failed and you want to trash all the effort and look at that or you want to take the whole thing into account and say well out of all of this 99% of the thing is good so therefore alhamdulillah this is good and whatever is uh, is not good this is an opportunity for me to make sabr this is an opportunity for me also to anjan alhamdulillah so the person says how's the food is alhamdulillah very nice mashallah may allah bless you for your effort similarly as i explained earlier about with regard to the recitation of the quran or with regard to something else a person may do look at the whole effort look at the thing completely and say who is this person what is this person what is the level of sincerity of this person how much of dedication effort has this person put into this into this work into this job and yes maybe some part of it is not up to the mark maybe they made a mistake somewhere alhamdulillah i am also human i also make mistakes how would i like it if somebody grabbed me by the collar every time i make a mistake i wouldn't like it at all so therefore let me not do that let me forgive the person and let me look at the positive aspect of it and say alhamdulillah all of this is good and then at some other point in time please never 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 when you are looking at feedback never do what people call a sandwich never combine a positive thing with a negative thing because it is human nature the negative thing sticks the positive thing will get discounted so your even your positive feedback which you gave them which you gave them sincerely will get trashed and they will only remember the negative thing so don't do that praise them alhamdulillah 
because you're looking at the positive part of it. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you and so on and so forth. Uh, thank them and praise them and, and, and bless them and give them dua. And then later at some other point in time, in a context where now, for example, the person is sitting in class and taking the same Tajweed example, now you say, here is the Tajweed class, we are reading Quran, now you say, well, please read. Obviously, if that is a mistake the person makes, he will make it again. If he doesn't make it, then maybe that was a one-time mistake, but it doesn't matter. But if he makes it again, now you correct him and say, okay, no, this is the way to pronounce it. This is the way to say it. This is what it means by your, by your pronouncing it in this particular way. This is how in some cases, not every case, but in some cases, you might say the meaning is getting changed. And this can be a problem as far as leading of Salah and so on is concerned. Do that in that context. Please understand, I'm not saying do not correct Absolutely, you must correct, especially if you are a teacher, it's your right to correct correct your students. You must correct. Now, to, like, but do it in a way which takes into account a person's dignity. Uh, do it in a way which is compassionate. Do it in a way which is kind, which is... And remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cause you to be in the same situation and worse if Allah does not like what you have done. How would you like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> to trash every good thing you did and catch you for one small thing. How many of the how many of uh, how many small so-called small things do we have in our life? Our lives are full of that, right? The other side of it, if you are corrected, please understand: a person who is correcting a mistake is doing a favor. No matter how unpleasant it might sound, no matter how uh, pained you might be, uh, you know, no matter how offended you might tend to feel, don't do all that. Don't feel offended. Don't be pained. Say Alhamdulillah, say Jazakumullah Khairan, you corrected me. Because if that person didn't correct you, you would continue to make that same mistake. Maybe you are making the mistake without being aware of it. Uh, so I'm not saying you will go to Jahannam for that. You will not go to Jahannam, inshallah. But it is still a mistake. It is still something which is bad. It is still something which gives a bad impression. Uh, it is still something which is a sign of ignorance. Why would you want to keep that? You want to keep it for what? There's no reason. So here is somebody who corrects you. Say, Alhamdulillah, thank you so much for correcting me. Take it positively. Even if uh, you were in this uh, beautiful feeling and because of this correction, the feeling went away. Alhamdulillah, don't worry about that. Don't feel bad about it. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for that feeling again and he will give you. So take the correction positively. So I'm looking at both sides of it. The person who is correcting and the person who is being corrected. We both need to look at it positively. But remember, mercy is the fundamental point of all this. The person being corrected also is being merciful. He's saying, okay, here is my brother. Uh, here is this person who corrected me. And let me be merciful towards him. Let me not hold that against him. Let me not feel bad about that. Let me not be angry with him. Because he said what he said in the wrong way at the wrong time. Doesn't matter. He's a human being. He made a mistake. No problem. And let me not catch that. Let me look at myself and say alhamdulillah thank you for correcting me obviously you can also approach that person later on and say you know what the way you corrected me at that point in time i appreciate your correction but if you had corrected me in a different place in a different time it would have been much better <clears throat> speak of it from your perspective there also don't point a finger at him and say you don't know how to correct what kind of a teacher you don't know talk about yourself and <clears throat> say this is how the effect of your correction, this is what the effect was on me. So that we are, you, this is your right to say what the effect was on you. And the person, inshallah, uh, will benefit from that because they have been given some positive feedback. My brothers and sisters, I want to end with this. I want to end with uh, reminding myself that you, the whole point of living, uh, uh, whole point of focusing on living Islam is to ensure that we give the best impression about Islam and to understand and realize that this is not a matter of play acting. It's not a matter of, we are not living in the world just to give impressions to people. Living Islam in, a, in, in the best way, living Islam the way Islam should be lived, is something which is the most beneficial for us. Imam Azhuri, he, he was a teacher of Imam Malik bin Anas. Imam Azhuri said that Islam spread the fastest after Fatah Makkah because for the first time, the non-Muslims were able to see the lives of Muslims close up, up close. Now, what, which Muslim is he talking about? He's talking about the ordinary Muslim. He's talking about the farmer and the carpenter and the, uh, and, and the, and the shepherd. And he's talking about the businessman, he's a shopkeeper. He's talking about the, about, about the people 
who were the ordinary neighbors of non-Muslims. He's not talking about the, the Akabirin or the Sahaba. He's not talking about Nabi Sallallahu That always was the case. But he said after Fatah Makkah, because there were no tensions anymore, there was no enemies and there was no war and uh, there was no state of, uh, of, of uh, high alert, uh, people were able to mix together. People were able to come to uh, come close to each other. And, then, and when non-Muslims saw the lives of ordinary Muslims, they were so hugely impressed that they entered Islam and they came into Islam. I remind myself when you were asked this question to myself, how many people are impressed with my life? How many non-Muslims have come into Islam because they saw my life? How many non-Muslims, of my, how many of my non-Muslim friends became Muslim because they saw me? May Allah forgive us. If this is the uh, this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah did not make this as a condition for forgiving us. Allah did not say, I will not give you Jannah unless you bring at least one person into Islam. Allah didn't say this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply told us, present Islam in the best possible way that you can present. On you, there is nothing more than to present clearly what you have been uh, charged with. Other than that, Allah did not hold us accountable for convincing people for, uh, for bringing them into Islam. But having said that, this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how beautiful it would be if people who lived with us, who worked with us, who worked for us, people we worked for, people who meet us, our business, our, our customers, our, our suppliers, if they were so impressed with the way we do business, with the way we we stand and sit and walk and live in our homes and our massages and our cars and the way we uh, we behave with each other, the way we interact with society, if people were so impressed with this that they came into Islam, how beautiful that would be. Let me remind you of myself that this is not a fantasy. This is not philosophy. This is not mythology. This is how things were once upon a time. And this is how things can become again if you and I want to make them that way again. It's all completely and totally upon us. Do we want this to happen? If we want it to happen, the framework, the format, the, uh, the, the uh, template we have, and that template is called the Quran, and the application of that template is the Sunnah, is the Seerah of Rasulullah I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jala jala lahu, to enable us to read and understand his kalam and to understand the implementation of that kalam by looking at the life of his blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill your hearts with his noor. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open your hearts to the message of Islam and to enable you to become living, walking, talking models of Islam which impress and hugely illuminate the lives of others so that that so that you spread goodness around you wherever you are wa sallallahu ala nabiyil karim wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin wa alhamdulillahi